pondering the ultimate fate of the universe now on BBC One in the sky at night. Last month, we talked about wimps, machos, and dark matter in our own part of the universe. Now we're going to go much further afield and look at dark matter and dark energy in the far reaches of space, naturally with Ian Nicholson. Welcome back in. Thank you. First of all, we must recap, I think, why do we think dark matter is there at all? I think the key piece of evidence relates to the way in which spiral galaxies rotate. Here's a particularly fine one, the M83, and uh, what we find is that most of the light in galaxies like these is concentrated towards the center, and if most of the mass were there, then we would expect stars and gas clouds in the outer fringes of those galaxies to revolve around the centers at uh, speeds that were much less than the speeds of clouds that are close in, rather like the planets going around the sun. But what we actually find is that the stars in the outer parts are moving just as fast as those in the inner parts, and that means really that galaxies like our own have to be surrounded by a, a massive halo of dark matter to provide enough gravitational attraction to cause their outer fringes to revolve as fast as we see them doing. And in addition to that, if we look at clusters of galaxies, such as the Virgo cluster that we see here, 50 million light years away, indeed, then we find that in order to prevent the individual galaxies from escaping, the total gravitational attraction of the cluster requires there to be a great deal more mass, 10 times, sometimes even 50 times as much as we can actually observe. So those, those are bits of evidence that uh, seem to suggest that uh, there is dark matter out there. Now, what that matter might be, well, part of it might be brown dwarfs. These are, in a sense, failed stars, stars which have such low masses that they never get hot enough for the same nuclear reaction to take place in them as take place inside the sun. Therefore, they are very dim. And we're beginning to see, as in this uh, image here taken with the UK infrared telescope, quite a lot of brown dwarfs around. There are about 100 brown dwarfs in that image, the faint brown reddish stars that you see uh, in the region of the familiar Orion Nebula. So we know there's quite a lot of brown dwarfs around, but they've got very low masses, less than 8% of that of the sun. And uh, even if there's uh, a lot of them around, there won't be enough mass in the form of brown dwarfs to account for our dark matter halo. So another option that's considered is things called machos, yes, yeah. massive astrophysical compact halo objects. Things like brown dwarfs, faded white dwarfs, uh, black holes, even planetary mass objects in the dark halos of galaxies like our own. But uh, the observations so far suggest that the amount of mass contained in these things is probably no more than about 10 to 20 percent of what's needed to account for the galaxy's behavior. So really the front runner now is uh, another possibility that uh, most of the dark matter is in the form of exotic elementary particles which hardly ever interact with ordinary matter at all and which therefore are called bari non-baryonic matter. The ordinary stuff, the protons and neutrons of which we are made, is called baryonic yeah. matter. Uh, these other exotic particles are non-baryonic. One possible candidate is the neutrino. Yeah. Um, recent evidence suggests that neutrinos, which are believed to be highly abundant in the universe and were once thought to have zero mass, actually have tiny little masses. But it's beginning to look as though those masses are so low, about a millionth of the mass of an electron, that there won't be enough mass in them either to explain what's going on in galaxies and clusters. I guess the front runner in terms of particles at the moment is a thing called uh, WIMPs, weakly interacting massive particles, which have been predicted theoretically, which hardly ever would interact with matter, but which are very massive, much more massive than protons and neutrons. And if they exist in large numbers, they could uh, bulk up to account for most of the dark matter in galaxies and clusters and uh, in the universe at large. If the total amount of dark matter is greater than the total amount of matter we can see, that's going to have a very profound effect upon the expansion and therefore the ultimate fate of the universe. That's absolutely right. Uh, we believe that the universe originated about 14 or 15 billion years ago in an explosive event called the Big Bang, which was really the origin of space and time and matter itself. Now, space has been expanding ever since, carrying the galaxies apart, and the recession of the galaxies we see now is evidence of that early Big Bang. 
there are various possibilities for the future, and we can look at these in terms of a graph here. Uh, going vertically, the distances in space are increasing. From left to right, time is increasing. Uh, one possibility is that we live in a universe that's going to expand forever. If there's not enough matter, not enough gravitational attraction, the expansion will slow down but will never stop and never reach zero speed. And that's called an open universe. On the other hand, if the average density of matter exceeds a figure called the critical density, which is roughly about you know, one hydrogen atom in every cubic of meter of space averaged over the whole universe, if the actual density is significantly greater than that, the expansion will eventually stop and galaxies will start to fall together again. So that is called a closed universe. Now, if we happen to live in a universe where the uh, actual density is precisely equal to the critical density, then uh, the expansion will go on forever, but the rate of expansion will get ever closer to zero, and this uh, sort of sitting on the fence universe is capable of expanding forever, but only just expanding forever, and is known as the flat universe. I wonder why flat, oh, it doesn't mean the universe is shaped like a pancake. No, not exactly. It's flat in the sense that if we think about a closed universe that's wrapped round on itself, uh, as Einstein said, the effect of mass is to distort space, to curve space. And if there's enough mass to make the universe closed, the curvature of space is positive. It's wrapped round rather like the surface of a sphere. And in that case, rays of light coming from a distant galaxy will follow curved paths through the universe. On the other hand, if the actual density of the universe is equal to the critical density, then space will be flat in the sense that rays of light travel outwards always in, in straight line paths rather than curved ones. In fact, you know, the curvature of space is determined by the amount of matter in it. That's absolutely right. Uh, we can think of it in terms of a, the ratio of the actual mean density of the universe, and that mean density can be made up not only of matter but of energy as well, because Einstein said that matter and energy are equivalent. So if we compare the actual mean density to the critical density, that gives us a ratio which is denoted by the Greek letter omega. And if omega is less than one, that means the actual density is less than critical and we're in an open universe. If omega is greater than one, the actual density is greater than critical and we live in a closed one. But if omega is precisely equal to one, then we are in this so-called flat universe. You know, a flat universe is a special case, and I've got a nasty, suspicious mind. I'm always wary of special cases. Is there any valid reason why omega should be almost or quite one? Well, there's a reason that uh, theoreticians rather like, and it has to do with uh, something called inflation. There's a, a theory called the inflationary universe, which is a development of the Big Bang theory that suggests that very early in the history of the universe, about 10 to the power minus 35 seconds after the beginning of time, space underwent a period of accelerating expansion, a dramatic acceleration that uh, blew space up and the universe up so rapidly to such a huge size that effectively it became, space became flat. Now, the inflationary theory has been very successful in overcoming some problems that the standard Big Bang theory wasn't able to account for properly. So the theoreticians are rather fond of it, but if it's right, it does require that space is flat and omega should be equal to one or indistinguishably close to one. Now the problem is that when we start looking at matter in the universe, if the only matter that was in the universe was the luminous stuff that we see in galaxies like the Hubble Deep Field here, then there isn't remotely enough uh, to meet uh, an omega equals one. Uh, in fact, the amount of luminous matter is probably only about half of one percent of what's needed uh, to, to meet the critical density. What do you think, Ian? Is there enough dark matter there to close the universe, or isn't there? Well, it's, it's a very interesting question. Um, really, we'd need something like um, more than 100 times as much dark matter as we have in the form of uh, visible matter. There are strong arguments to suggest that uh, whatever's out there, um, it can't really be principally made up of baryonic matter, the ordinary stuff of which stars and planets are made. Uh, even including dark baryonic matter, there probably can't be more than about 5% of the critical density in the form of baryonic matter, dark or luminous. And uh, a reason for thinking this is that the Big Bang Theory has been brilliantly successful at uh, explaining the relative abundances of the lightest chemical elements by saying that um, the elements hydrogen, uh, deuterium, which is heavy hydrogen, helium-3, helium-4, and, and also the element lithium, 
uh, can be very neatly accounted for by nuclear reactions that took place in space during the first few minutes of the very hot, dense Big Bang. But the problem is that uh, if the uh, average, if the density of baryons in the universe had been much more than 5% of the critical density, there wouldn't be anything like the amount of helium-3, deuterium and lithium uh, that actually exists in the universe today. Now, further vital clues come from looking at the cosmic microwave yes. background radiation. Yeah. Now, this really is again going back to the Big Bang. In the very early stages, the universe was hot and dense and yeah. opaque. But about 300,000 years after the beginning of time, uh, everything would have cooled down to about 3,000 degrees. And at that stage, space became transparent. Radiation could travel throughout the length and breadth of the universe. And the radiation that was released at that time has been diluted by the expansion of the universe and stretched in wavelength uh, to leave us with a very faint background of microwave radiation with millimeter and centimeter wavelengths spread over the entire sky. Well, this was first detected back in 1965, and then in 1992, the Cosmic Background Explorer satellite, COBE, uh, produced a map, a detailed map of the microwave background. Co Color-coded, of course. Color-coded, as you see here, to pick out slightly warmer and slightly cool, cooler patches on the sky, which are indicative of areas of slightly enhanced and slightly depleted density at the time the microwave background was released, when the universe was just 300,000 years old. Now, very recently, earlier this year, uh, some much more detailed investigations of the background have been uh, released and they were carried out by a couple of high altitude balloons, one called Maxima that flew over Texas uh, and another one called Boomerang that was uh, launched and circulated about 35 kilometers above the snow-capped uh, Antarctic continent. So what happened then when the results uh, came out? Uh, here we're looking at some of the uh, results obtained by Boomerang and we're looking at now a very small patch of the microwave sky and you can see lots of little different colored splodges there which correspond once again to areas of slightly warmer and slightly cooler uh, uh, microwave radiation which correspond in turn to areas that were just a little bit denser than average and a little bit less dense than average at the very early stage of the universe 300,000 years after the beginning of time. Now, what we're seeing here is uh, features on the scale of about a degree. These splodges are you know, comparable to the size of the full moon in the sky. I should say, really, that the differences in temperature we're looking at are very small. They're only about 40 or 50 millionths of a degree, but they're significant nevertheless. So these tiny variations in temperature tell us a good deal about the curvature of space in those far reaches of the universe. That's right. If we look at the actual boomerang results here at the top of the screen, uh, and then we look at three simulations at the bottom, then what we see in the bottom left is a simulation of what would be expected uh, in the microwave sky if space were positively curved. That tends to, because of the bending of light, makes uh, the splodges of hot and cold microwave radiation rather larger. Uh, and over on the bottom right-hand side, if space were curved in a negative way that causes parallel lines to diverge, that would produce features that are smaller. But if we compare the flat space simulation, which is in the center of the screen at the bottom, with the actual observations, you can see that the scale of the uh, hotter and cooler patches match really quite closely with what Boomerang is saying. And that really is quite strong evidence that the value of omega must be close to one and that space must be uh, pretty close to being flat. The size and distribution of these features gives us uh, another clue. There ought to be, in addition to the, the features around about a degree or so in, sky, in, in size, some smaller features in the microwave background as well. And, and the micro Maxima and Boomerang are beginning to show these. And from the observations so far, it looks as though uh, these uh, observations give us clues to the relative balance of the amount of cold dark matter, that's the WIMPs and so on, and ba ordinary baryonic dark matter. And it looks as though there's probably about 5 to 10 percent ordinary baryonic matter there. And that's just about consistent with what the uh, nucleosynthesis and the Big Bang limits impose. Uh, but the observations also seem to imply that uh, there certainly isn't more than about 30% of the critical density in the form of WIMPs, cold dark matter, and possibly significantly less than that. So it does look as though we've got a shortfall. If space is flat and omega's got to be equal to 1, then uh, only about 30% of it's accounted for by dark matter of various kinds, and the rest really has to be made up with something else. 
uh, theoreticians, because energy affects the curvature of space just as much as mass does, theoreticians are now suggesting that there's another commodity out there in space called dark energy that makes up the shortfall. And we can represent the current thinking on the relative proportions of things in the universe by this pyramid here. At the apex of the pyramid, we've got luminous matter, the visible stars and galaxies that we can see, and that makes up maybe about half of 1% of the total. Neutrinos, if they've got very tiny masses, might make up about 0.3% of the critical mass. And then if we move on to ordinary dark baryonic matter, things like machos, it might make it up to 5% of critical. Then add on to that uh, the cold dark matter, the particles that we've called WIMPs, uh, no more than 30%. And then the great bulk of uh, what's determining the geometry of the universe is this thing called dark energy that makes up 65, 70 percent of the total. Well, dark energy sounds remarkable, like something out of science fiction. Any idea what it could be? Well, it's uh, almost anybody's guess at this stage. But one possibility that's been mooted goes right back to Einstein's time uh, before the expansion of the universe was discovered. Uh, Einstein introduced to his equations of general relativity something that he called the cosmological constant. It was a property of space that uh, effectively was rather like cosmic repulsion. The idea was in that time that uh, Einstein knew there were lots of galaxies there and he was puzzled as to why they weren't falling together, being pulled together by gravity. So he added this extra term to his equations to give this repulsion that just balanced gravity at large distances and stopped the universe from collapsing. Of course, when a few years later, Edwin Hubble showed that the galaxies are rushing away and the universe is expanding, he thought, oh, this is uh, my worst mistake because uh, had I not introduced cosmic repulsion, I'd have predicted the expansion of the universe. But in recent times, people have gone back to looking at this cosmological constant. And the effect of the cosmological constant at large distances would be to stretch space and cause the universe to accelerate in its expansion rather than slow down with the passage of time. Now, this may seem rather bizarre, but there have been some results recently uh, concerned with observing supernovae exploding stars in very distant galaxies. And we can see some of the data here. Uh, the brightness of the supernovae is measured vertically with the fainter ones at the top and distance or redshift is measured out to the right and the dots there represent individual observations of very distant supernovas. If, that's, if we draw in a solid line, then that shows us what we would expect if we were in a universe that was expanding at a constant rate or a gently decelerating one. And you find that the actual supernovae lie above that line, which means they're fainter than we would expect. And the reason they, they are fainter, it's suggested, is if the universe is accelerating, then in the time between the light being emitted by this supernovae and uh, it reaching us here, uh, the universe has expanded by more than would be the case if we were in a steady expansion universe or a one that's slowing down. Therefore, their lights had to travel further and got more diluted. Therefore, they appear fainter than we would expect them to be. So the evidence at the moment is beginning to point towards our living in an accelerating universe. That is what you would expect if this cosmological constant were real. Uh, and therefore, if the cosmological constant is the dark energy that uh, theoreticians are looking for, the fact that the universe seems to be accelerating fits in quite well with that notion. You know, when we began The Sky at Night so long ago, all this would have seemed science fiction. Well, in less than two years, we have our 45th anniversary. And I wonder if by then, we will solve the problem of dark matter and the fate of the universe. <laughs> Time will tell. Ian, thank you very much. It's new letter time. If you want your newsletter, then send your stamped address then wrote to newsletter number 79, The Sky at Night, BBC TV, London W12 70S. We have our website, of course, www.bbc.co.uk slash sky at night or CFAX page 620. And next month, we are back planet hunting. So until then, good night.